Welcome to the Rediscovery channel. This is the channel where I, Ivor Kovac, and my friend uh, Stilgar, we each try to come up with a topic from history that the other person has not heard about. And most of the time that's what happens, but not all the time. And today it's my turn to try and uh, surprise Stilgar. So I'm going to ask, have you heard of St. Anthony the Great? Never heard of him. No. Oh. Okay, I actually thought there was a that you might have because um, you're interested in the Orthodox Church or churches a little bit, but okay. Maybe I have. Tell me more. Maybe it'll come to me. Yeah, it might. Um, Saint Anthony the Great. He's from Egypt, and he's uh, considered to be very important in the Coptic Church. And just you know, for the sake of our listeners, I'd like to explain the Coptic Church briefly. It is the official church of Egypt. When the Roman Empire went completely around the Mediterranean, uh, you had the early Christians who were all Jews originally, but they went and they spread, taking advantage of the infrastructure created by the Romans, and they spread the message. And you had different major cities that developed as like uh, almost independent churches. Like you had a major church center in Rome, you had another one in, um, I think it was Antioch, and then you had one in Greece, and then you had one in Egypt, mainly centered around Alexandria. And, of course, uh, the one in Rome ends up becoming the Catholic Church, and those in the other cities towards the east, like in Greece and Syria and Egypt, they all become a different Orthodox Church. And they're all different churches with their, their own uh, hierarchy. And um, the, but recently they've established reciprocity. So like if you're a, uh, a Greek Orthodox, you're allowed to take the communion in like an Egyptian Orthodox and a Russian Orthodox and so on and so forth. So the Coptic church is the church of Egypt with its headquarters in Alexandria. And it's very old, just as old as the Catholic Church. And what they they have uh, the different one of the differences between them and the Catholic Church is that they allow their priests to marry. And what they say is that since you're the, if you're the priest of the church, you're going to have to give advice to the congregation, and that's going to include married couples. So you should have some experience in that area in order to give advice to these people. And also it does say in the Bible that, you know, those who are in positions of leadership in the church should be the husband of one wife. Okay. So, but they, the Coptic Orthodox church, they do have monks and the monks, they have like monasteries and the monks are celibate. Uh, they do not get married, but the, they're not to be confused with priests. They're not in charge of the churches. So St. Anthony, he is considered to be the father of uh, monasticism. And he lived, he was born in Egypt, and uh, he spoke Egyptian. And by the way, the Coptic church, I would just say, is all that's left of the original Egyptian civilization, the civilization of the pharaohs. And today they make up about 10% of Egypt. And uh, up until the... Um, the early 20th century, the Coptic people, they still used the Egyptian language as conversational speech, but today it is only used in church liturgies. So St. Anthony, um, he was born in the year 251 AD, and he died in 356. He lived to be 105 years old. So I've got um, uh, my notes here. He was he lived through quite a few Roman empire, emperor, blah, <laughs> quite a few Roman emperors. I'm not even sure how many. There were some emperors that were very short-lived, and there were more than one at a time. But to name a few, he lived through um, Diocletian and Constantine. And when he died, uh, I believe Constantine's sons were actually in charge. So he witnessed the split of the Roman Empire into two different parts. And he was born uh, to a wealthy family in Egypt. Both of his parents were Christians. And when he was a kid, um, 
he resisted uh, hanging around with other kids. He also resisted education. So he never actually learned how to read in his whole life. And um, <clears throat> he wasn't that interested in wealth. And even though he could have had the nicest and the, the fanciest of food, he always ate uh, simple stuff. And um, when he was 18 or 20, um, not really sure the exact age, both of his parents died and he was left in charge of the estate and, and also his younger sister who was just a little kid. And so Anthony, from a young age, the main thing he was interested in was just uh, religion and having a closer relationship with God. And he didn't really care about anything else. And um, so when his parents died, he sold most of the estate as well as um, the, the wealth, the money that was in the bank account and, and the possessions and everything. He sold most of it. And the money that was, and, and gave the money to the poor, like he didn't keep any of it. And he kept a little, well, he kept a little bit of money just for his, the upkeep of his sister and for his house. But then um, he went into the church and he heard somebody reading, uh, I forget what passage it is, I have it here. But basically, right as he was walking in, the guy was reading the passage where, um, Jesus was saying, don't be mindful of uh, tomorrow or something like that. And so he decided, I'm going to give up everything now this time. And he went and he gave away the rest of the money and he gave away the, the, the house, which I guess was a nice house. And by the way, uh, his parents, they owned 300 acres of land, which he sold. And he handed his sister over to some women that were just uh, virgins by choice. Because back then there was no official uh, like uh, monastery or nunnery. You just had people that were choosing just to be just to be as spiritual as possible and not get married and start families. So that's what the the book says: is he handed his sister over to some virgins to raise her and take care of her, and then he ends up living as a homeless guy out in front of the house that he used to own. And to support himself, he works with his hands for a living, uh, I guess being a carpenter or, uh, and stuff like that, or maybe farming. And then the money that he gets paid, he uses what he needs for food, and then he gives the rest away to the poor. So he doesn't want to keep anything. But he also, he does this work because he doesn't want to freeload either. So it's, it's kind of interesting. And... Um, his free time that he has, he spends it listening to people reading the Bible. So even though he can't read, he actually memorizes most of what he hears. Uh, I don't know how much of the Bible he memorized, but maybe all of it. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, maybe he had, and, and this is the part that actually seems kind of weird to me, is that instead of learning to read, he just memorizes based on other people reading. And I was thinking, well, how hard would it be then to just memorize the alphabet and read? Maybe he was dyslectic. Yeah, I don't know. It's uh, There's a few things in, in his story that strike me as a little strange, but I don't know. I mean, there's there's literacy used to not be as necessary in the ancient world as it would later become. Like you could, you could get by without being able to read. Um, and it, and you know it wasn't as important, but uh, of course your civilization that you're part of cannot be illiterate or it's going to totally fall apart. But the average person doesn't have to be able to read, and so um, but that's what he does. He he memorizes and um, he spends time emulating like other holy people. And so if there's like one guy who has um, uh, excels in charity, like he tries to mimic him in that. If there's another guy that excels in uh, um, uh, speech, he tries to imitate that. So he's trying to become like the most uh, the most um, virtuous as he can by imitating and learning from the virtues of others. And he eats um, once a day at sunset. 
and his main food or his only food is bread and salt and then he only drinks water and he slept on uh, a mat of rushes which are i guess reeds on and just straight on the ground and he doesn't wear any kind of uh, perfumes or ointments and what he says in his own words is um it were better for young men to prefer exercise and not seek for things that make the body soft rather to accustom it to hardships mindful of the apostle's word um when i am weak i am strong for he said that when the enjoyments of the body are weak then is the power of the soul strong and he he fat, spends a lot of his time in prayer that's the main thing that he likes to do and keeps trying to go off by himself in order to pray and meditate and he also would fast a lot and then um eventually what he does is he like supposedly according to the the story here satan is so troubled by uh saint anthony at this stage um that he comes to personally tempt him and then a lot of the book that i'm reading and by the way i should disclose my source so my main source here is uh the life of saint anthony the great which was written by another guy named saint athanasius and athanasius was a pupil of anthony um but unlike anthony uh, he knew how to read or he must have because he wrote down the uh he wrote letters and he wrote this account of saint anthony's life which he said still didn't include everything that anthony did um so saint anthony after weathering these temptations he decides to go out into the wilderness of course uh, i should have mentioned like before he goes out into the wilderness because of his charity and his deeds and his hard work um he impresses a lot of the people and becomes popular in his community but he still wants to get off by himself like his ideal situation is to be by himself where he's got nothing to do but pray and um to that end he goes out to some tombs that are out side of the town and he has a friend close him inside of the tomb and the friend is supposed to come and check on him and bring him bread while he's there and what happens is satan comes and strikes him at night and he is found unconscious like basically comatose when his friend returns and they take him back to the town and they and, and he revives and he kind of slowly recovers even though it's not mentioned what kind of injury he has so i'm wondering if you know it was just uh something that was psychological like you know kind of like sleep i'm not saying that he didn't encounter satan or anything like that i think you know that uh um there probably is something going on cuz he talks a lot about the demonic which i'll read some of that some of the quotes from him and the advice he gives um but basically he recovers from this attack and they take and then he says take me back to the tombs so they do and the you can see images of this online there's a lot of paintings and they show the satan and the demons they return and they take on like the forms of animals and beasts and they make all kinds of noise and and threaten him but they don't uh they, they don't actually do anything to him but it and, inspired a, a bunch of art right there's a lot of art yeah there's a lot of art about it and the art is actually wrong because it shows him as an old man you know what during this time but this was actually when he was in his 20s or maybe 30s at the latest when the incident happens where they come in the forms of animals so what i'm what my thought is that um uh is that when satan strikes him that it's not like a physical strike that leaves a wound because one thing that saint anthony says to a lot of this is that they don't have the power to lay hands on us he says that satan and his demons they hate humanity so much that if they really had the power to hurt us they would have killed all of humanity already or at least all of the christians they wouldn't bother with taking on forms to frighten or with temptations or with intimidation they would just kill us so um this is where i want to read a quote here and you know like right now oh wait let me get to the right page here like right now there's all sorts of talk about uh aliens and uh, most people 
when they hear like UFO, they automatically think alien, even though that's not what UFO means. It just means this thing, unidentified flying object. It's flies, but, and we don't we don't know what it is. Don't know what it is, but people automatically assume it's like some silvery flying saucer. And if you type in UFO on the internet, I did it in three different search engines last night. You'll see this recurring motif. So, Isn't it a tic tac nowadays? Uh, what? I think it's a tic tac shape nowadays with the latest ones. I don't know. I, I did a search and there's still uh, saucers. I think it's mostly fake, to be honest. But um, let's see. So here. Um, so this is after this is his next adventure, like uh, after he is has come back from the tomb. He decides again to go out into the desert. Uh, so this is from chapter four. Um, the next day going out with still greater zeal for the service of God, he met the old man before mentioned and asked him to live with to live in the desert with him he refused because of his age and because this was not as yet usual but antony at once set out for the mountain yet once more the enemy seeing his zeal and wishing to check it threw in his way the form of a large disk of silver antony understanding the deceit of the evil one stood and looked at the disk and confuted the demon in it saying whence a disk in the desert this is not a trodden road, and there is no track of any faring this way, and it could not have fallen unnoticed, being of huge size, and even if it had been lost, the loser would certainly have found it had he turned back to look, because the place is desert. This is a trick of the devil. You will not hinder my purpose by this, Satan. Let this thing perish with thee. And as Anthony said this, it disappeared like smoke before the face of the fire. So, oh shit! It's been confirmed. Yeah, they're, if we they're have... actually demons. There you go. Yeah, I like so... it. <laughs> hey, yeah, isn't that... that what Alex Jones is saying? Also, I don't know. Is... I <laughs> I stopped I, listening I actually... to him, but wasn't he also complaining about they're actually in uh, interdimensional demons or something? All this UFOs. So that's interesting. Um, interesting. Yeah, okay, don't... go on. Yeah, I don't really listen to Alex Jones. It's not because I disagree with him necessarily but just the fact that he yells all the time <laughs> makes it hard for me like, yeah I, I don't like uh people that are constantly um uh steer ruled by their emotions like yeah it gets on my nerves that kind I like of like some some yelling but you know yeah but not um all the time. anyway you know like uh, i'm gonna do also a video of this for my mm -hmm. small personal channel so i can go into more in depth because St. Anthony does say a lot about demonic encounters and what to do when they come. And it does, it does like reading this stuff, it does remind me of like the alleged alien encounters. And you know, my position is that there could be made, like, I don't know whether or not aliens are real, but I don't believe that these things are aliens. So, but, uh, hmm. but, um, so it's definitely, definitely very interesting. Actually, uh, my wife sent me something the other day about, I think it was in the 16th century where they had these spectacles. They saw the, these giant space battles in, uh, in, it was in Germany and in France and some other cities. And uh, s some people said, you know, they were aliens and other people said they were like beings fighting each other. So that, that might yeah. make a good topic actually. If you can yeah, research I might, that. I, I might have to see, I actually suggested it. So I'll, I yeah, might keep that one on file with all the, uh, the aliens things going on. Yeah. Yeah. It, it might be worth it to do that. Like my, my whole thing is, and I'll beat this horse on my own personal channel. I won't say much here, but basically the universe is very huge. Like if there was another inhabited planet in our galaxy, that trying to find them or having them trying to find us would be like if I took a piece of uh, black volcanic sand, like one tiny grain, and threw it on like that regular beach where you live, where the sand is yellow, and then told you go and find it. Like, you're probably not going to find it. And if there's a, it, it, the odds are just too low. And if there's an interstellar civilization that can travel and go to other planets, there's no, absolutely no reason at all for them to come here unless it's to, like, the, the only thing they could possibly have here that they couldn't get anywhere else in the universe would be, like, an expanded food source. 
you know, because we'd have plants and animals native to our world that they don't have, but they would have no practical use for humanity and um, n- yeah. no, no need of for water. I mean, they could well, get more I've, water. I've from, always been, like, your I've all, yeah, the, the whole water thing. There's water everywhere. Like uh, every asteroid has water on it. Almost every, there's so much, so much water in space. I don't see how that would be an issue, but yeah. Um, yeah and, and the distances are just, huge so if if you know as far as we know faster than light travel is impossible um, well if, yeah. if by by conventional motion it's impossible yeah but if you use utilize like a wormhole or you fold space or you do like the alcubierre drive you then you have to do some pretty kooky science which is you know like it's not completely impossible but Anyway, that's kind of the the problem with space is if you look at the nearest uh, star uh, alpha centauri it's i think it's uh almost three light years away or is it more um oh, no. i mean you know like the fastest we can travel it would take like eighty thousand years or something to get there it's it's you know because it's just let's even let's say we would make it up to light speed you know which we, we can't and then if you get there you'd also have to slow down from from light speed and the, the amounts of energy you would need are you know, pretty much infinite. Yeah, I think it is, Mm -hmm. I think it is possible. And like, from what I've seen of the Alcubierre drive, you know, something like that. But I think because of the way humanity is, that politics and wars are going to make it so that we never achieve this. And I think if aliens really became aware of our world, they would, they would probably like drop a marker buoy at the edge of our solar system and say, this is the worst place in the universe. Don't ever come through there if you are smart. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's the thing is like we'll, we'll probably, who knows? Anyway, this is an interesting one, right? But it's yeah. it's uh, so yeah. I should have known about Saint uh, um, Antonius, right? Anthony. Or Anthony? Anthony yeah. yeah, yeah, and Antonius in Dutch. Sorry, but uh, yeah, no, I should have known because he also he goes into this ascetic. Uh, tradition. I think I may have mentioned him on the Diogenes video as well, um, which is, you know, this whole um, living this kind of, yeah, simple lifestyle, which also has ties again, well, not directly tied, but there are some similarities to Buddhism, um, where you just kind of deprive yourself of anything uh, but the essential, and you just focus on uh, on prayer. Um, yeah, that's yeah. actually I'm I and this uh, story actually kind of reminded me a little bit of Diogenes, you know, like how he he makes himself homeless by choice and then um, he chooses exercise and keeps his own life to a minimum and he didn't really own anything other than like his clothes that he was wearing and the mat that he slept on at least at least as far as I know if he ever came in, into money he would give it away to homeless people. Um, but, but, uh, anyways, um, yeah, let's go back to the aliens though. Cause I want to yeah. hear your, uh, your story. Your, your yeah, demons. I, I, yeah. This mm-hmm. was like a huge, huge tangent. So, um, <laughs> but, uh, some people like that supposedly, but at any rate, let's go ahead. Um, so after he encounters the silver disc, what he does is he goes into an abandoned fort that's in desert. And, you know, if you're keeping in mind about Egypt is that it's mostly desert, and people usually live along the Nile, and which is uh, extremely fertile. Yeah. Yes, yeah, and mm-hmm. even so, it's still hot and miserable. At least to me, it is, or it would be. <laughs> um, to me as well, I like it's yeah. temperate. Yeah, we're, right. we're too we're too white and northern <laughs> to live in such a place. Yeah. But um, yeah, so he goes, and but Egypt is an ancient place, right? And by this time, it's been it, it's been it has a long imperial history of its own. And then it's also been ruled by the Greeks and now it's under Roman rule. So, uh, and they used to fight with the Nubians and the Libyans. So I, I don't know who made this fort. The book doesn't say, but there's probably a lot of abandoned forts in, in there back then. And he finds it full of reptiles and then he, and then they're driven out before him. Um, and he has a friend who he, he comes, he goes there with just like six months supply of bread. And then he has a friend who is supposed to come every like twice a year and bring him a new supply. 
and he he goes into the deepest darkest um port part of the fort where and seals himself in and to preserve his food supply he sleeps on it and what the book says is this is an old egyptian technique to preserve your food supply and my guess is it's uh flat bread You probably they're, they're, sleep on it to keep the rodents away, I'm guessing. Yeah, I imagine it's squished very flat. And it's probably already flat to begin with. But I don't see how it would keep bugs away just to sleep on it. But yeah. Unless it's so compact that Oh yeah, maybe. Yeah. I don't know, man. But I, I you know, there's people that eat out of garbage dumpsters today. And uh, not even because they're poor, but just because they want to and somehow they survive it. So Actually, good um, for your immune system. Yeah. yeah, I'm not gonna be trying any of this stuff myself, though. <laughs> so, all right. So he yeah, sleeps so, on his bread. Right. So he goes. So the point is, like, uh, this guy is supposed to check on him twice a year and bring food, six months mm. worth of bread. And um, it says here, like, uh, his acquaintance who came to see him often spent days and nights outside since he would not let them enter. They seemed to hear a tumultuous crowd inside making noises, uttering piteous cries, shrieking, stand off from our domain. What have you to do with the desert? You cannot stand against our contrivings. At first, those outside thought there were men fighting with him who had gone into him by a ladder. But when they bent down through a hole and saw no one, then they thought it was demons and feared for themselves and called to Antony. He listened to them, though he gave no thought to the demons. And going near to the door, he urged the people to go home and fear not, saying that the demons made these displays against the timid. Do you therefore sign yourselves and go away bravely and leave them to make fools of themselves? So they went away, protecting themselves with the sign of the cross. And he remained and was not wise hurt by them, nor did he weary of the struggle. For the aid of the visions that came to him from on high and the weakness of his enemies brought him much ease from the labors and prepared him for greater earnestness. And eventually what they do is they come and they like rip the door off of the fort. But this is like, he stays in here for 20 years. And then after that, they come and they rip the door off of the fort and they find that um, he hasn't changed physically. Like he still physically fit in spite of just sitting in there in the dark and he hasn't grown fat and he hasn't become scrawny either. So there are a lot after this, a lot of people are impressed by um, his, his way of living and his spiritual power. So they begin to imitate him. And now you have a bunch of uh, ascetics moving out into the desert and they're beginning to form monasteries a little bit, you know, uh, later on, after there's monasteries established, um, St. Anthony, there's this other account here where Satan comes to visit him in person again. And, and like uh, he says, let's see, uh, once someone knocked at my door in the monastery and going out, I saw a tall and mighty figure. Then on my asking, who are you? He said, I am Satan. I asked, why are you here? And he said, why do the monks and all other Christians blame me for no cause? Why do, you, why do they curse me every hour? When I said, then why do you annoy him? He answered, it's not I that annoy them, but they disturb themselves, for I am become powerless. Have they not read the words of the enemy? Have they not read that the swords of the enemy have failed to the end, and his cities thou hast destroyed? I have now no place, no weapon, no city. Everywhere are Christians, and now the desert, too, is grown full of monks. Let them watch themselves and not curse me without cause. Then I, marveling at the grace of the Lord, said to him, Liar, thou uh, liar, though you always are, and never speaking the truth, yet this time you have spoken true, even against your will. For Christ has come and made you powerless and cast you down and disarmed you. He, hearing the Savior's name and not enduring the burning heat thereof, disappeared. So, eventually what happens is uh, 
there's an emperor, a very short-lived guy called Maximin, Maximinius, and uh, he persecutes the Christians rather heavily. And so, um, you know, they put him on trial, like show trials and stuff, where the verdict is pretty much predetermined. So Anthony, he wants to become a martyr, so he goes into the cities and he gives aid and help to all the Christians that are being persecuted. And he's hoping that he will be martyred, but he's not. And instead, like the courts, they order that he stay away and outside of the city because he's creating a disruption. And so when uh, this is over, this persecution, then Anthony, he decides to become even more ascetic and he stops watch washing his feet. And uh, I believe he also starts taking baths, but I'm not completely sure of that. So he stops washing his feet. And then uh, as he gets even older, he starts like people are coming to him and there's miracles and all this stuff. And people are making a big deal out of him and thinking that, um, you know, he might be that he's like the greatest thing. And St. Anthony, he's afraid that people will give him the credit instead of God. And he starts to also get annoyed by um, the attention that he's getting. So he decides to move out into the deeper desert by himself. And uh, he does. And he settles in this oasis where there's like a spring of water beneath a hill. And whenever uh, he makes that like his main abode. And whenever um, people get the attention gets too intense for him, he goes back there and he prays. And his, he's already an old guy at this time, and his followers, they're bringing him bread. But he decides that he doesn't want to trouble other people to bring him bread. So he asks them to bring him seed, and he plants his own uh, food supply there. His, like, he grows wheat. And then he also decides to grow vegetables so that he has something to give to those who come to visit him as guests. And um, at one point, uh, let's see, I will read this. He gets Greek philosophers that are pagans that want to come and try to make him look stupid. Um, but it says, once two Greek philosophers came to him thinking that they could experiment on Antony. He was then in the outer hills, but understanding the men from their looks, he went out to them and said through an interpreter, why, O oh philosophers, have you toiled all this way to a foolish man? And when they answered that he was not foolish but very wise, he said to them, If you have come to a fool, your labor is useless. But if you think me wise, then become as I, for we ought to imitate what is good. If I had gone to you, I would have imitated you, as you have come to me. Become as I, for I am a Christian. They departed in wonder, for they saw that even demons feared Anthony. Um, some other uh, here it says some others of the same kind met him in the outer hills and thought to mock him because he had not learned letters. Anthony said to them, "And what say you? Which is first, the mind or letters? And which is the cause of which, the mind of the letters or the letters of the mind?" When they answered him that the mind is first and is the inventor of letters, Antony said, Then to one whose mind is sound, letters are needless. This answer astounded them. Oh, sorry, this answer astounded both them and the listeners. They went away marveling to see such wisdom in a plain man. Um, for he had not the rough character of one who is reared in the hills and grows old there, but he was both gracious and courteous. So, yeah, man, it's it's interesting, right? And um, eventually, like uh, he also um, he, his his con it also says that he never showed uh, extremes of like he he never showed fear or panic or anger or anything like that. His mood was always steady, and um, eventually, he's about to turn 105 like he gets he gets very old and he always wanted to be a martyr but instead he lives to a, a, a wise old age and he senses that his death is coming and so he makes one last trip and when he gets to his destination a little bit later he he falls ill and while he's dying he says to his closest followers 
um, to take and bury his body in secret because at this time uh, the Egyptians they had a they had this weird custom custom which maybe we should look into and and check up on but um, they would keep people would keep the bodies of the dead in their house with them like if it was a, a close family member or something like that or somebody that was considered to be very wise and good they would keep the body that you know like they've always been mummifying their bodies anyways for thousands of years and the climate there is very conducive towards that but he said i don't want my body like preserved and in somebody's house and he also didn't want people to uh raise him to godhood and venerate him or anything like that so when he dies he's buried in secret and um you know he's still very important of course to the coptic to the Coptic Church today, um, but yeah, that's all. That's all that I'm really going to say. Um, that concludes my presentation. On my own channel, I probably will do this video, going into more detail about his spiritual encounters and such with demons and his advice mm -hmm. regarding that. Um, and if I do complete that video, then um, we can put a a link to it in the in the description underneath this one if people want to see more in depth into his philosophy and, and into his struggle with uh, demons and such so yeah it's an interesting uh interesting guy and, and should have known who he was uh saint anthony yeah. special shout out to our orthodox brothers um uh, on the internet um this topic is for you <laughs> No, and uh, interesting what you said about his uh, body, because uh, as you were talking about him, I actually looked him up, and apparently there is a monastery uh, in the north of my country that is still it's the only occupied monastery today, and they claim to have a bone uh, or a splinter of the bone of St. Anthony. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. Of a couple centimeters in, in silver, in a silver canister. So maybe I should make the two and a half hour drive and then check it out sometime. <laughs> yeah, you can check it out, but I doubt that it's really a piece of him because he deliberately had that knowledge hidden. Only two guys knew where he was buried. And I believe that uh, Athanasius was one of them. And, um, you know, there's more pieces of the true cross, allegedly, than there is wood to make a... Like, there's more pieces of the true cross than there is wood in a cross. So I think... My view is that, like, most of the relics are fake. Um, I think uh, one thing that happened in medieval times, in Europe in particular, is you had hucksters that they knew that people were looking for relics. So they would do things like rip up a part of their fence and take it to, the, to these people and be like, I swear this is a remnant of the true cross. I got yeah. it when I was in the Middle East. You know, stuff like like that, and actually, um, John Mandeville, I finished reading that whole book, by the way, The Travels of John Mandeville. He talks about, like, how different people claim they have this relic and that relic, and he's like, but actually, they're wrong, and they're lying, because the real relic is here, and everyone knows it, and probably both groups are lying or wrong. Or they, they may yeah. not know, they may just be tricked, so. Yeah, no, that's probably true. I actually have a piece of the Berlin Wall. I wonder if that one's real. <laughs> it's just a piece of concrete. <laughs> Who knows? Somebody walked but, by a construction site. Saying, hey, yeah. Here's a no, piece of I, Berlin I bought it in Berlin, so who knows? Yeah. But uh, yeah, good point. But still, nah, it's an interesting guy. And of course, monasteries became a really important part of the, the culture. Um, and also, uh, you know, it was where a lot, a lot of the intellectual um although saint anthony didn't know how to read and write that's where they would actually copy a lot of the old texts uh, greek texts roman texts uh and preserve them for humanity and that was done in those monasteries um and because you know that's what all they would do is pray and 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 write um interesting that he had this uh, these visual manifestations it made me think of um the monks in the Brother Karamazov book, um, which of course is another, it's a Russian Orthodox uh, religion where there's also a monk that sees demons in every corner. And 
I wonder if that's somehow part of the orthodoxy or if that was just part of medieval times, if that was more common to to have this visual manifestations or interesting uh oh, I, interesting I, yeah yeah i think when it comes to the medieval stuff you should be very suspicious because um like you know after having read a lot not i wouldn't say a lot but in the last recent times i've read uh, quite a bit of medieval literature and <clears throat> one you know like they're so wrong about so many things like remember with prester john and the river of jewels and all that stuff so what I when it comes to the theological stuff, what I would do is you got to really judge by the character. Like uh, Saint Anthony, I'm I'm my inclination is to think that this stuff is real, and uh, it's stated. It reads actually kind of like a book of the Bible, and it doesn't get into um, weird stuff that can't be explained either through science or through an act of God. Whereas a lot of the medieval literature, like remember we talked about St. Yeah. Brendan, there's just mm -hmm. a lot of nonsense there. That's, um, you know, clearly. So if the, it, you got to just go on a case by case basis, but when it comes to medieval stuff, my tendency is to be dismissive and they'll say stuff that like a lot of the medieval guys are also anti-Semites, you know, and, um, like one of the things John Mandeville would say is like the reason that God chose Jerusalem is because it's in the center of the earth and it's it's uh that's not true like the equator is in the center of the earth right mm -hmm. but um it is where three land masses meet and that's not why God chose Jerusalem or the Israelites like it says in the Bible that God chose them because of Abraham not because they were the greatest or the wisest of peoples because he had that special relationship of Abraham. And then the reason that, you know, the Jews are God's chosen people is not because they're a superior race and not because they can't be punished for wrongdoing, but just because God kept his word to those people like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah. There's a lot of theological misunderstandings and I think the medieval mythology, I don't find any fault with St. Anthony, though, but uh, one thing that's kind of interesting, and I might talk to my pastor about this, is uh, St. Anthony it really doesn't seem like um, he believes in once saved, always saved. And he talks a lot about guarding your mind and how Satan wants to um, lead you away from God so that you either become useless or you die and go to hell. And he talks about the progression of things and spiritual encounters and all this stuff. And I've never seen a demon before, but I've also never achieved even like half the level of the spirituality of St. Anthony. And another thing about like the medieval, a lot of the medieval monks, and I, I can't remember where I read this criticism, but they talk about how even though they say they're living in um, poverty, they're wearing very nice clothes and and they're living in a nice place, and they're eating good food. And St. Anthony didn't do any of that stuff. Yeah. He was, like, sleeping in his own sweat on top of bread and then eating the soggy bread from his sweat <laughs> in a yeah. tomb. Yeah, but that, that became a... part of the tradition, right? Um, and, uh, yeah, and there were a lot of people throughout uh, the Christian world that uh, followed in his footsteps, and uh, some of them actually had themselves literally walled in. Have you ever read about those people? They mm. they they no, they went into a room with a door like a small tiny room and they literally were walled in they had a wall put in and that's how they would remain like they they did that in germany for a while i was reading about a german saint a woman who actually came up some with some awesome music but she probably deserves her own topic uh, by herself yeah anyway you can't save that for a topic don't tell yeah. me it is so I can find yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, being safe forever makes me think of the the parable of the weeds. Um, actually, that that's like that you're not safe forever necessarily, right? Yeah, that's right. Some uh, people start off and then they get distracted, and um, but then like what the those people will say, like the Calvinists, is to say, well, that person was never saved in the first place, and that's kind of something I've always. Um, grappled with is like whether or not that's true and um, if you know if it's once saved always saved how can you be sure that you were ever saved in the first place and if it's the other way then 
at what point do you cross some threshold where you are uh, no longer redeemed? So yeah, it would be interesting to see what, uh, for me anyway, because personally I'm, I'm highly interested in the Orthodox faith. Uh, yeah. I'm reading, reading about it and if I would speak the Russian language, because um, over here it's mostly Russians, I would probably be interested in joining, but uh, would be interested to, to learn more about how they look at this uh, this issue. But if we have any Orthodox listeners, well, yeah, yeah I man. think uh, theologically, I I didn't I I can't argue with his theology. I think his lifestyle was too hard for me um, to do. But you know, I I recommend you know you might you should read the this book. It's not very big. It's only 122 pages, and they're small pages. So read it to your kids. Um, you know, I read it to my older son. He really likes this stuff. I, I did enjoy uh, when we went to that Coptic uh, service together. That was uh, that was that made a big impression on me. Yeah, I yeah. like the feeling of antiquity and stuff. And yeah, they like firmly rooted in their history. So anyway, I like how they open up and they start remembering all the martyrs that have fallen <laughs> for the faith. And um, I mean, anyway, I thought it was yeah, the Romans very nice. Killed, uh, the, quite a few of them uh, under Roman rule. Yeah, like uh, Maximinius, he killed. Of course, I need to ask my buddy like um, when that stopped because. I think uh, they actually still had some grievances against the Roman Empire after the split of the empire, which actually St. Anthony lived through the split, so maybe that's referring to the persecutions of Maximinius. And um, actually the sons of Constantine, they wrote a letter to St. Anthony asking him for like his wisdom and his blessing. So that's kind of cool. Right? But I think... Um, cool, I dude. Think and Egypt is always... Uh... I mean, what you mentioned about your son loving, uh, I used to watch the Discovery Channel, anything Egypt. It's just a really interesting place. Of course, you know, nowadays it's it's completely different. And, and what you mentioned that the Copts are kind of the closest you can get to the original culture. Um, yeah, their yeah. name, uh, yeah, what, what I heard from a Coptic priest is that originally the land was called Egyptus, and the people called themselves Gepts. But when the, the Arabs invaded, they couldn't say, like, the G sound at the beginning of the word, so they called them Copts. Mm. Yeah. All right, so <laughs> yeah. if you listen to the end, thanks for listening. Um, and do leave us, do, if you like our content, you know, like, share, and comment. And I think that's it. Let's close with it. Yes. Yeah.